everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. A strange thing happened on the way to a better world. In pursuit of an admirable quest, that is, a world free of sex discrimination, where you're judged on your own qualities and not your sex, truth and falsity went topsy-turvy. The truth, the science of sex differences, became dangerous, unmentionable. And in its place, the conventional wisdom, which is a rag bag of ideas that have long been extinct but are kept ghoulishly alive by popularity, they became the entrenched orthodoxy, influencing public thinking, agendas, and policy making, and completely crowding out science and sense. Now, my aim is to show you why the current orthodoxy should be abandoned and why, if you really care about a fairer world, the science does matter and it matters profoundly. I'm going to take two examples, both about the professions, because they really very well epitomize the orthodox litany, how society systematically discriminates against women and how at work they are victims of pervasive sexism. So here, the conventional wisdoms. Well. Women in ghettos. Why in medicine are men from surgery, women from pediatrics? In law, men from corporate, women from family. In science, men from physics, women from sociology. It's because women are ghettoized into stereotypically female professions and specialties where prestige and pay are the lowest. And why is it always men at the top? The highest positions and prizes, whether influence or income, heads of state, CEOs, professors, Nobel laureates. Why? Because for women, there's a glass ceiling. For men, there's a glass elevator. Well, but you might be thinking, isn't that conventional wisdom true? Uh, isn't the evidence compelling? No. <laughs> Nonsense. Thank you. It's wholly misconceived. It's both ignorant of modern science and it's fighting battles that have already been won. But before I explain to you about that, I've got two caveats. One is about averages. We'll be comparing averages, not differences between individuals. Try not to think in individuals, but about differences between groups. Specifically, how characteristics are distributed differently in the two groups, males and females. And second, let me stress that I'm emphatically not denying that discrimination exists. I'm not denying that. Rather, it can't be the whole story, and it certainly isn't the story in the way that it's generally told. So let's get straight to some science of sex differences, and I'll start with tastes, that is, with interests. There's an experiment in which sex-stereotyped toys, trucks and dolls, were given to mixed sex groups. Now, I'm sure that all of you would guess correctly which sex preferred which, but these males and females were vervet monkeys. Now consider newborn babies. Even at one day old, girls prefer a human face and boys prefer a mechanical mo mobile. Now, neither those monkeys nor babies had been brainwashed, socialized, stereotyped, ghettoized, or any of these other things. And they hadn't even encountered toys or mobiles previously. Rather, what these results of these little experiments capture is an evolved sex difference in interests. Men are far, women are far more interested in people, and men are far more interested in things. This difference is one of the largest of all psychological differences between the sexes. And also, it's by far the largest when measured in career interests. And that difference in career interests, by the way, hasn't changed over the past century since records were first kept, even though there have been massive social changes. That still stands out as the largest difference in career interests. What's more, it's been found that a person's interests are the most powerful predictor of what their entire career will be like, even more so surprisingly than talent. So 
Look at females in the UK professions. From over 80% in the people-oriented down to 6% in things-oriented. Well, ghettoization, really? Or it might it not be choice? By the way, even those 6% female engineers are overwhelmingly in bioengineering, that is, working with people or other living things. And even women in the top 1% of mathematical ability, 1%, that's very, very high, choose instead, unlike their male counterparts, they often choose careers working with people, again, people and living things, biosciences, doctors, and so on. And yet, the conventional wisdom stubbornly refuses to acknowledge that women's own interests might be a cause of how they choose their career, of what careers they're in. And now to temperaments and men at the top. Men are vastly more competitive than women. I'll tell you why very quickly. Quick evolutionary sketch. Give a man 50 wives and he'd have children galore, but a woman with 50 husbands, no advantage whatsoever. So, natural selection favored men who competed strenuously for mates. And all men now are descendants of those victorious competitors. From this, much follows. Men are far more ambitious, status-thinking, hierarchical, single-minded, opportunistic, persevering, <laughs> risk-taking. Their entire life strategy is a far higher risk, higher stakes game, and far more dedicated to winning. They notoriously find any area to be first, most, biggest, best. I got from the Guinness Book of Records, beer mat flipping, haggish hurling, or extreme, <coughs> extreme ironing. <laughs> there are worse ones than that, I can tell you. And they even appropriate all the summits. This was recently held in Paris, the Global Summit of Women. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, what are women like? Well, they're sort of far less of all the above. That's the best way to think of it. Now, obviously, greater male competitiveness alone pushes men to the top powerfully. But science also reveals another such sex difference. It's to do with the tales of these statistical distributions that is, the ends of the curves. Um, yeah. For all sex differences in all species, this is not just humans, all sex differences in all species, there's a difference in the shape of the tails. Among males, the variance, that's the difference between the best and the worst, and the most and the least, or whatever it is, tallest and shortest, is far greater than among females. Females tend to cluster round the mean, that, that um, curve there in the middle. Females tend to cluster round the mean. The tails are far less far apart, but among males, the variance can be great, huge. So males are almost bound to be overrepresented, both at the bottom and at the top. I think of this. Uh, I hasten to say, metaphorically, as more dumbbells, but more no-bells. <laughs> An extreme example of the right-hand tail, which um, even the scientist who found it said in the paper, staggering, um, for the ability in mechanical reasoning, in the top 0.1%, that's admittedly a very rarefied atmosphere, Try and guess what the male-female ratio is. It's 236 to 1. That's, that's how far the Nobel's dumbbells effect can push the difference between males and females. Now, greater male variance, as you can see in that extreme example, can profoundly influence male-female differences, particularly those that most enrage conventional wisdom, that is, the predominance of men at the top, always looking to the top, never at the dumbbells. But nevertheless, greater male variance has become what in the States is called a third rail issue, that is, touch it and you die. And that precludes any investigation of what is really a very potent cause. 
So, sex differences stem ultimately from different reproductive strategies, but they pervade our entire psychology, and their distribution differs giving rise to differences between the two groups. So the life priorities of men and women are not identical. I'll repeat, not identical, because the, the orthodoxy conflates equality and sameness. Constantly, when people are concerned about equality, what they immediately jump into instead is sameness. But you can't expect sameness for males and females, on average, there are these differences. So conventional wisdom began with an injustice, with women being denied choice just because they were women. But that's morphed into a deeply misguided quest. Sameness of outcome for males and females in all fields, 50-50, 50%. Well, that's not good enough. Conventional wisdom is a science-free zone with factoids where facts should be, and a dreadful jargon generator where theories should reign. It's outrageous that it should be taken seriously at all, that it occupies a position where science and evidence should prevail, and that it dominates policy, even, even though its precepts have long been rendered utterly extinct, first by a scientific understanding of sex differences, and second through political progress against sex discrimination. Now, science doesn't dictate goals. I'm not saying it's only science, but it can help us to achieve our goals. And as Marx didn't ever quite say, if we want to change the world, we first need to understand it. And how can we forge a fairer world if we allow beliefs that are long extinct to stand in the way of what is really indispensable, the Darwinian science of sex differences? Thank you. Science stands by itself. It doesn't care what people think about it. Um, you know, the, the universe didn't care about the Inquisition. It went, c c continued circling around. And genetics is, lo genetics is like that. I mean, genetics is, is a scientific way to make sex boring. Okay, that's what, that's what I do professionally. And we discover things that may be uncomfortable. But if they're uncomfortable, too bad. I think the morals have to be put on one side. So I think that's the issue. People are unwilling to accept the truths of science on ideological grounds. And it doesn't really matter what the ideology is. It's the w unwillingness to accept the truth I don't like. Mm -hmm. Helena, did you want to add to that? Um, yes, there, there is a problem about the ideology and its winning. Because, um, for example, policy making is entirely made on the grounds that Male, males and females are the same. And roughly speaking, if females aren't the same as males, then it's because they're being held back in some way. And so there are all sorts of attempts to get 50-50% in engineering, for example, which is ludicrous because on average, on average, there is much less interest in that sort of area. I'm not talking about ability, just less interest. And similarly, um, one of the most egregious examples I came across recently, which I'll share with you just for the fun of it, was the Institute of Physics of all institutions, which, of course, started off um, its recent report with the idea that we need more engineers, more physicists, more hard scientists. Yes, of course, we all agree with that. And then they notice that there aren't as many women as men doing it. And then the problem suddenly changed halfway through the report. And it ended up in an Institute of Physics report with suggesting that couldn't we shift more males over into the humanities and so on and say we'll get more 50-50. Even if very few women are doing uh, engineering, uh, there'll be so few men there anyway, so it would be more evened up. Now, that's a kind of madness. I know this sounds like, as if it can't be true. But that's the kind of madness you get when you're trying to impose an ideology that assumes you must have sameness, otherwise you can't have fairness. You can have fairness and you should be treated fairly on the grounds of who and what you are, and you don't have to be the same as anybody else in order for that to happen. I think you've made a really compelling case that a lot of the differences that we see in, in gender distribution and different career pathways are 
naturalistic. They seem to be evolved traits that were in response to some sort of selective process. Yes. But of course, in philosophy, there's this sort of famous notion that what is, you can't derive an ought from an is. And I want to ask you about the ethics of this. I, I wonder just sort of um, what are the implications of your research for the more ethical question about what should be, we be trying to encourage? And, and, and also, related to this idea that you know, having more homogeneity in, in anything is, is, is detrimental to the survival of an idea, of a field. And so I'm just wondering sort of how the ideas about how things are are related to how they should be. I, I entirely agree with you about keeping that distinction. And that's why I, I feel it's so important that we understand, as Steve said, the difference between science and ideology. Um, but from the point of view of what we should encourage, well, we should encourage things that, for example, we need, like we need more doctors, if we need more engineers, we should encourage it. But then we should encourage people to be doctors or engineers. What we don't want to do is discourage anybody who wants to, has a real interest and wants to do something. And that's a woman being an engineer or a man doing something typically feminine. And it's a very, very simple thing. Um, but the planning of what you need in society and which people you encourage to go for it are two different things. Great. 